Good afternoon and welcome to the Octavia Lab's first author program. We're very excited to be hosting a conversation between author Linnell George and city librarian John F. Sabo. My name is V. Ha and I'm the Librarian 3 for the Octavia Lab. The Octavia Lab, named in honor of Oct author Octavia E. Butler, is a do-it-yourself makerspace and studio space at the Central Library of the Los Angeles Public Library. The lab is 3,000 square feet and includes 3D printers, virtual reality gear, a laser cutter, audio-visual digitization equipment, sewing machines, and much more. Los Angeles Public Library cardholders are able to use the space for free. Starting in April 2020, the Octavia Lab, in partnership with nonprofit organizations, city entities, libraries, and makerspaces, has supported job creation, manufacture, and delivery of over 20,000 face shields to frontline hospital workers at over 20 Los Angeles area hospitals. The funding for the PPE project is a mix of Los Angeles Public Library in kind support, private individual donors, nonprofit grants, and a community of volunteers throughout the nation with substantial support from the estate of Octavia E. Butler. And now, a bit about our guest for today's program. John F. Zabo is a city librarian in the Los Angeles Public Library, which serves over 4 million people, the largest population of any public library in the United States. He oversees the Los Angeles Public Library's Central Library and 72 branches. The library has received the nation's highest honor for library service, the National Medal for Museum and Library Service for success in meeting the needs of Angelinos and providing a level of social, educational, and cultural services unmatched by any other public institution in the city. Linnell George is a journalist and essayist. She is the author of three books of nonfiction, No Crystal Stare, African Americans in the City of Angels, After Image, Los Angeles Outside the Frame, and her latest, A Handful of Earth, A Handful of Sky, The World of Octavia E. Butler. This newest book is published by Angel City Press. A former staff writer for both the Los Angeles Times and LA Weekly, she covered social issues, human behavior, visual arts, music, and literature. She taught journalism at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, in 2013 was named a USC Annenberg Getty Arts Journalism Fellow. In 2017, received the Huntington Library's Alan Jutsey Fellowship for her studies of California writer Octavia E. Butler. Her commentary has also been featured in numerous news and feature outlets, including Boom, or Journal of California, Smithsonian, KCET Artbound, KPCC's The Frame, Los Angeles Review of Books, Vibe, Chicago Tribune, Washington Post, Essence, Black Clock, and Miz. Her liner notes for Otis Redding Live at the Whiskey O'Go-Go -Go earned a 2018 Grammy Award. A Handful of Earth, A Handful of Sky, The World of Octavia E. Butler, Linnell's newest book, is available for purchase at the library store. Proceeds from these purchases help support the library. If you have any questions from Linnell George about the book or about Octavia E. Butler, please put the questions into the chat or comments, and we will have time for questions at the end. And now to our show. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome. Uh, and a very special thanks to Viha, her team in the Octavia Lab uh, for all of their work. They have made a, a tremendous contribution uh, during this uh, very, very tough time. And not only does V lead the work in the lab, but she also led the process that led to the lab being named the Octavia Lab. And that was just one of these special magical moments in library land where the naming of the space just was the perfect uh, the perfect name. And we all just said, yes, of course, uh, when, when the process led to that. Uh, Linnell George, uh, it is such a pleasure to have you. Welcome to the virtual library. Uh, I've really been looking forward to this. Uh, and uh, thank you so much for joining us. I am so excited to be here. Thank you, John, for having me. Thank you, V, for helping to organize this. Um, Octavia would be so proud. She'd be shy about it, but she'd be proud. <laughs> well, I think all of us at the Los Angeles Public Library feel this connection to, to Octavia Butler and know of her connection to the library and her love for this institution and, frankly, all libraries. And so to have your, your incredible book um, and to help us know her and get to know her and, and feel more connected to her. It really is a, a gift to everyone here at the library and I, I know libraries everywhere. And I just, I, I want to begin by just say, giving a, you a, 
hearty congratulations uh, wow. and, and applause for what is a beautiful and a very, very special portrait of uh, Octavia Butler. And as I read the book, I not only had feelings of appreciation to you for, for writing it, but also a sense of thanks to Octavia Butler for amassing this very, frankly, unusual uh, and really wonderful, deep and extensive uh, archive of uh, quite a variety of things, which we'll uh, talk about in a little bit. And, and, and in the book, uh, you wrote that to understand her, you have to examine all the bits and pieces that it took for her to collage together a public self. And this book does that uh, so well. And can you just speak a little bit to how you came to decide upon this format and how those bits and pieces sort of helped to tell the story of Octavia Butler? Um, yes. Um, it's a great question because it wasn't like, like wonderful discoveries usually aren't, are, it wasn't a straight line, a lot of serendipity, which is what happens in libraries. Um, so I was finishing up a project for um, a nonprofit here in LA called, uh, Earth's nonprofit called Clock Shop. And they were doing a year long initiative celebrating Octavia. And it was um, for the 10th anniversary of her passing. And so I was in the archive finishing up something that was, we were calling a posthumous interview. And as I was working through the archive, I, um, I started to realize that I was beginning to start something new <laughs> because I was finishing up the interview part, but I was looking at various things and to understand the archive, it's, it is huge. It's 380 boxes of material um, across her lifetime. And it's uh, boxes and boxes of manuscripts, you know, and revisions, but it's also really small, beautiful objects that are very humble, modest. So things like her bus passes and her calendars and date books, her Los Angeles library card, which she saved. Um, and these are the things that really started to speak to me because they, they were really about her day-to-day -day life. And the things that she used were things, they weren't expensive. They were things that you and I have sitting around. And I just thought she made magic out of these tiny, humble things. And that's when it started to hit me. It was like, this is a recipe for something larger, something, and she created something miraculous. Well, and, and things like drop-in cards to magazines. And, yes. you know, when you think about authors' archives, um, you know, we learn about authors and their, their archives, their collections through their published, their unpublished works, their, their correspondence, their notes, drafts. But, but with Octavia Butler in this archive and, and all of the keeping that she did of all of this, we have shopping lists, bits of ephemera that she's written on, envel I love the envelopes. Yeah. And it's really so wonderful and it, it helps you to create the intimate portrait of her that you did. And, and there were just little things that, that when I was reading your book that, that came through, one, of, one thing that really was, I thought, just very sweet and I, I'm not sure why, but it was a shopping list for for tacos, you know, it was yeah. the tomatoes, the lettuce, the packets of taco sauce. Yeah. Yeah. It was just so sweet and it was so personal and it was just this little intimate window into yeah. her and her life. And it, it was vulnerability and um, how unusual. I mean, yeah. Yes. And as you said, it's like this, the vulnerability, the, this, and also too, it's like, I, you begin to see like on these pages, it was full of so many different things. So you could really get a sense of what one or two days were like by just looking at one page. So she might've been writing a letter or she might've been working on a manuscript, but there were always things going on in the margins. And I fell hard for that marginalia. <laughs> like I just started to just look at that because phone numbers or she'd seen something on television she wanted to buy. Um, you know, those, you can buy those greatest hits albums, you know, like the, or some kind of Kate, yeah, Kate L greatest hits. Right. She would write those down and she was going to, why well, I'm going to get this Fats Domino collection. But, but then she might have some sort, there'll be calculations, um, 
there'll be lists of things she wants to look at at the library too. So you get this beautiful map of her beautiful mind on one piece of paper. So my favorite quote of yours out of the entire book may very well be what you just did, which is I fell hard for the marginalia because <laughs> I still get that, you know, that, that, um, that, that, um, that love of all of the sort of little jottings that, that she did. Um, so on, on science fiction, you wrote that um, for her, uh, that it lifted the ceiling and dissolved the walls. Mm -hmm. And that she saw the genre of science fiction, um, and I, I guess really her, her own, the way she interpreted it, as offering readers uh, alternative versions of not just the universe, uh, but of themselves. Mm -hmm. And your book's title, which is taken from her own words, uh, really speaks to that uh, as well. And would you tell us a little bit about how this came to be her literary path? And and in, in reading your book, I, I was a little surprised, but the, the seeds of that were there very, very early, I think. Yeah. Yes. Um, the seeds were absolutely there early um, and due to the library <laughs> because, and due to her first, the Pasadena library where she grew up mm -hmm. and it was reading and this journey through books and going to the Peter Pan room in the Pasadena public library, the central library there, the main library. Um, she read her way through the library at by before 14. And so she couldn't go into the adult room. Um, so she was just really hungry and she liked fantasies and she liked horse stories. And <laughs> she started writing her own versions of stories, or I shouldn't say writing, she started telling herself stories and making herself the star of her stories. And then she would tell these stories to her mother. And her, but one day she forgot the details of one story and worried her. And, and her mother said, well, maybe you should start writing them down. And so this started at a very young age, 10 years old, her, this practice of writing. And then she discovered science fiction and she said, and then she sort of broke away. Like it, it broke her head. It just like opened her head up and broke through. And she realized, Oh wait, I can do this. And she saw this terrible movie, which or she, which she calls a terrible movie, um, devil girl from Mars, a B movie. And after she's watched and she's a kid and she's like, wow, I can tell a story better than that. And that was the open road to science fiction for her and having more space to create a world that included her in it. Was that the moment she really, she was, there's, there's a lot of self doubt and a lot of questioning. And was that the moment that she, she knew that she really had a skill, a talent, that she was a, a masterful storyteller? She didn't know she was masterful, but she was determined to find her mastery through mm -hmm. habit, hard work, sitting in the chair, revising, reading. I think she really understood really early on, even before she discovered science fiction, that writing was going to have to be her life. But because she, something, it, it activated something in her. And it, I, I would call it hope. I don't know if she would have, but it certainly felt and looked like hope because she loved living in the story she was telling. And I think further along, she begins to get better and she begins to get self-confidence, but it takes a while. It takes a while. And I think you even conclude the book talking about she just learned that it was one sentence at a time and mm -hmm. the, the, the what ultimately was being painted was um, there was self-love there. Yes. Know, really, all, all along. Absolutely. Absolutely. And she had to, she had to come to that and she had such clarity. That's the thing that gets me. It's like, I don't know with so many, she had so many hurdles. Um, she wasn't always encouraged in school. She, I looked at her report cards and I just, it broke my heart sometimes because I thought, how do you keep coming back from this? And she did. She always kept coming back. Her resilience is, was amazing. Well, and, and some of the teacher comments uh, 
were were heartbreaking, you know, yeah. which include which, and she of course saved those things and she saved them. Yes, <laughs> she saved the report card. She saved the teacher comments. Uh, I think sometimes she'd note them in the in her diary, but um, yeah. that that was so that was were tough to read, you know, because you you wanted her to be encouraged and um, and celebrated for those. And then there there were teachers who did that. Yes, right. who saw her and encouraged her and saw the imagination in in and and just wanted to encourage it. The thing that really got me too, even it was mechanical things. I loved this where she went to her science teacher and asked him, would he type a paper for her? I mean, a story for hers so she could send it off. And he did, <laughs> you know, she said, you know, I just wanted to have the lines be straight and, you know, and I didn't want it to have eraser holes. And, you know, and Mr. Paff said he would, and he did. And she, she didn't win the contest. But in a way, she won something, I think, bigger. And, and that was knowing that there were going to be people out there that were unexpected and would help her. And she was Oc Octavia E. Butler, Estelle, yeah. Uh, yeah. Octavia Estelle Butler. And her family called her Estelle. And this e evolves in the book where Estelle is the, is the private me uh, for yeah. her and the self-conscious, the very private person. Uh, and then there's Octavia, which is this public self that she, you use the term in the book at some point, calling it world building. Um, yeah. And that's certainly her writing, but it's her, her, her building her own world herself. Can you, help, can you help us in the audience understand that, that yes. duality between Estelle and Octavia? Yes, she, um, she made a decision um, early as she was trying to figure out like, how am I gonna create this writing life? Um, how am I gonna be a writer? And, and so there's all that that's happening, but also she realized I need a persona. I need to figure out a way to shore myself up because I'm shy, I'm introverted. I don't like crowds. I don't like public speaking. Um, I hunch, I'm tall, but I hunch over, you know, I slouch. You know, she saw all these things, she journaled about them, but she realized if she could, as much as she could write a beautiful story that convinced a reader that they were in a world, she thought I can write myself in and write a persona that I can fully possess and fully inhabit. And so she started to think about things like, okay, well, Estelle may be too shy to do public speaking. Estelle may be do too shy to wear high heels and makeup, but Octavia can. And she started listing these things about these personality traits that Estelle would have versus Octavia. And she wanted to give Octavia the lead. And that's sort of how it would start in journals. Um, this, I got, I have to create a public face armor to survive. Which speaks to that resiliency and how she was, she was a planner and she knew what she needed. And, yeah. uh, and I, I loved also that when she's talking about Octavia, she talks about, um, I think wearing bright colors and big jewelry and heels that made a six foot <laughs> person seem even taller. <laughs> I love that. Which was so great. And I love that it was so specific that way too. And it wasn't the things you would expect. It really was creating a character, you know? Ab absolutely. Um, th throughout the book um, and, and the archive as well, I imagine, uh, there are these, these directions that she gives herself. You're gonna do this, or you're gonna take this step, or I'm gonna take this step. Um, a a couple of favorites were where she wrote, and I think you have, there's an image of this in the book where it's do homework for the week, finish it, exclamation point, underline. And then remember, the library opens at noon. Yes. And the, of course, I, I'm yes. completely biased, but love the, the way the library just keeps coming uh, back yes. in her writings. But what are these sort of conversations with herself about and almost these, these directions that she's repeatedly giving um, herself? I guess it's part of that planning of... Mm -hmm. It's partially the planning, absolutely. Um, she knew, and one of the objects I picked, because each chapter is organized around 
one of these objects we were talking about. Um, so the calendars are really important and making lists are really important because there was a time in her life she was in school working and writing and it meant her days were extremely long and but she wanted did not want herself her dream to lose priority so um part of it was making lists and the other part was she realized when she started to tell people about what her dreams were not all of them really believed in her and they were to to their credit and um they thought they were helping her it's like you know little negro girls of the era you know like you don't dream to become a writer like as a profession i mean this is something you can do as a hobby so she told herself i need to keep my own counsel and so that's how these these notes and these reminders start she doesn't really know at this point how to do affirmations or what what an affirmation is but she senses that she needs something and once again in a library serendipitously she stumbles across a box of books that she doesn't even know why they're there but there they are sitting and they're these health self help books you know norman vincent peel and you know um you know how to win friends and influence people dale, dale carnegie and she picks them up and she sees something in this that may help her and that be, starts to become part of those little notes she writes to herself and, and she makes a contract with herself in the <laughs> 70s that i'm gonna have a hundred is it a hundred thousand yeah. dollars by 1975. yes <laughs> this comes up again and again. again and again she does it for months it's every day you know and sometimes you can see she's tired because she doesn't finish the sentence <laughs> you, know, like, you know or maybe you know or maybe she doesn't she's not in for the dream that day fully but she does try you know so yeah she had to visualize it and that's what she would do and sort of a nuts and bolts question but was the archive um sort of chrono chronological as she kept it, or is that something that the that the archivist at the Huntington where the archive is, is held uh, did? I'm assuming it was that or in, in some chronological. I, when I spoke to Natalie Russell, who was the, um, it, it was the curator of the papers and who had, she, she's the one that unboxed them and had to find some organization. She told me a couple of stories. There were times where she was trying to figure out okay, do I keep her organization so that you can, you all who are in, in the archive and using it can ha have another sense of her or I don't, do I help untangle it a little bit? Because there were times where, because she was trying to save money, for example, she may start a novel longhand in one of her um, loose leaf notebooks or in one of the um, Mead notebooks and and then she'd put it away but then she'd come back later like 10 years later and start writing in it again <laughs> so there's a lot of interesting cross-referencing in the archive and so you may pick up a thread one place and then there's a note you know it finishes here so and then what the beauty of this is that for the researchers we actually would keep notes for one another and help one another out. Like, you know, did you find the rest of this? Like, oh, I did, you know, it's in, you know, box 178. <laughs> so um, it's been, it's been really wonderful to spend that time doing this sort of this hunt. But for the most part, it's pretty easy. It's, I shouldn't say easy. It's once you're in her head, you understand where things might be. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, and that's that speaks to the the skill of the archivist and being able to know yeah. how much of that organization from the, the the person is important to preserve, and then how much reorganization is needed, as you say, to, to provide access to it. And and hats off to both Octavia Butler, but also the the archivist for making decisions to keep some of those things that one could imagine someone might say that that might not be important to the story of this person yeah. for knowing that the business reply card or the drop-in card from the magazine that she wrote something on or all of those library call slips are, were things that might offer a picture and a might help paint a picture exactly researchers into who the person was and 
Okay. Yeah, that intimacy for me, I mean, that's that's what made me understand her so much better was seeing that she, you could just see, she just grabbed in anything that was there. And cause in ideas here, I gotta, I gotta get it down. Um, even down to the post-its, you know, and, and I would love, I love that too. And I know we were talking about this um, in the reading room. I was talking with, um, about, you know, you always get nervous. It's like, you see a post-it on the floor. It's like, is that Octavia's post-it? <laughs> you know, <laughs> or is that my post? <laughs> you know, um, but because it's you know that another writer friend of mine said the same thing. The beauty of looking at some of this this material is really seeing that she was us. She was she used the same tools. She back to again like taking you know really humble objects and creating miraculous worlds with them. Yeah. You know, I have those same little memo books, <laughs> you know, I didn't do that with mine though. <laughs> um, and you also speak a lot in the book about how the story of Octavia Butler is, is a Southern California story and really in many ways could only happen in California and that there's a connectedness to the geography, the spirit of this place um, that it's it's linked to the notion that there are possibilities uh, that um, that can happen that you know are beyond the horizon here. Um, and the parable of the sower, of course, is rooted in in uh, Southern California. And where did this connectedness with place fundamentally come from? And of course, her family moved from the South and right. Right. The contrasts. I think you know. I, you see it really early when she's writing about her grandmother and her mother um, in her journals. Um, the family was in Victorville for a while before she was born. She was able to visit that area. Um, they were out, you know, working with their hands, working the land. Um, there are beautiful um, sentences. It's almost like poetry where she's just describing what that, terrain looks like, what the sky looks like, what the electric wires look like. It's things we've seen. It's things that we've imprinted. So it started really young with her. And then when she moves to Pasadena, she begins to like an inventory of what she lives around, you know, um, flora, fauna. Um, she makes notes of about, you know, really minute changes from month to month to year to year. Um, she's really tracking climate and climate change too, mm -hmm. but she's really looking down you know, like this really intimate notes. And they look, when you look at the page itself, it looks like haiku, you know, that she's taking down, but mm -hmm. there is a level of awareness um, and appreciation for sense of place that it, it started very early. It started very early. I, there's this one detail I haven't even shared this and I wanted to put it in the book some way, but it's just, a, she had this calendar that, um, not a calendar, but a journal and you're supposed to check off, is it sunny, rainy, cloudy, whatever. She added a box that said smog. <laughs> so she got it. <laughs> Love it. I was like, yay, Angelina. <laughs> so great, so great. Um, th there is there is a chapter devoted to um, to libraries and what the library meant to her, and I have to say thank you because there are so many quotes from you in talking about libraries and her love of libraries that I just wanted to thrust my fist into the air and go yes this just that are just would be beautiful taglines for libraries everywhere. Yeah, um, you. You talked about how it was a place to sound out desires, wild notions, that it was a place to be audacious, audacious in her questioning. And she, of course, had this, and you've, you've referenced it before as a child, this relationship with the uh, Pasadena Public Library and, and what that meant to her. And then ultimately um, with our central library. And she kept the library stuff, the yeah. call slips brochure she kept the, uh i don't an application to be a tutor, tutor yeah. um, you know um 
And it was almost, and maybe this is the city librarian in me reading into it, but it, it was almost as though she considered the library and things of the library having some degree of sacredness or that they were, they were sacred to her. And can you just, knowing her so well and having gone through all of this material, talk about what the library meant to Octavia Butler? She, the, she would say, um, and she said it in little ways, but what I saw collectively with all of the references, and there are many, um, that the library allowed her, of course, to do her work and do her research, but it allowed her to become herself. I mean, that's no small thing um, because she used it in, for so many different reasons. It was a babysitter for a while. It was school for a while. It was her office for a while. Um, when she was casting about for work she could try to do to fit her Estelle personality, for example, you know, she went to the library and started researching careers and making lists about things. And so some of the call slips that exist are um, are though or are some are those. So it's things like um, the photography. I love yeah, that. the photography game. How to make money in photography. Yeah, where to sell your pictures. Yeah, tested money making for photography. <laughs> you know, she was really looking. And then this is mixed in to information about plantations in Baltimore, which means she was doing that research while she was writing Kindred. So these two things are happening at once. But she's written a couple of times about the library being the free universities of America. And, and one of the reasons she wanted to tutor is that she, she could see very easily, like, if you can't read, you can't access so much and she wanted to help adults in particular you know lose their fear and try and she wanted to be able to be the one that could do it you know um she said it mattered to her and she wanted to do it through the library well you know what the library meant to octavia butler is what we in libraries hope it for every child you know mm -hmm. uh, and uh it's 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 beautiful and she never forgot the library, even with success, no, she she gave back, didn't she? Yes, she absolutely did, and she was, you know, constantly sending people there, and um, she she wrote three of her books there. But even after that, and after she had money and you know access to bookstores and could build her own home library, she loved being in the library. The the physical search for her meant something. Um, being in those rooms again, back to discovering things, you know, by chance on a shelf that would open up her, her mind. And, you know, she, she thought of the library almost as a person. It was a family member, you know. Well, and she, she talked about it in, in absolutely those terms when she, um, was writing down in her, her diary, I guess, about, about actually being in downtown LA the day of the, the tragic and horrible yeah. fire in 1986. And, um, you know, in it, it will, in your book, you describe how she's on a bus yeah. coming up fifth, up the hill up toward the, hill. the library and how the bus driver says, well, if you want to get off at any of the next four stops, you should yeah. get off now because it's blocked. And, she asked why, and he said, well, it was because the library was on fire. And then she writes about how personal this was yeah. to her, how unthinkable it was. And she struggled with that piece. I can see, you could see the, the penciled version first. And she says exactly, you know, um, this is like writing about the loss of a friend. And at that point, she thought it, you know, like the library was going to die. And, and she didn't know how she was going to feel about that. I mean, aside, obviously she was devastated, but she had to even work through, she had to work through her emotions before she eventually wrote a, a piece that's based on those notes that she wrote that day. Yes, and she just happened to be on the bus on the way to the library. I think she was going to tutor that day mm -hmm. and do research. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And one question that, and we've talked a little bit about this already, but one question that just kept coming coming back to me over and over and over again in, 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 as I read your book is um, 
was there no corner of the human record that Octavia was not interested in? And I, she just had this incredible curiosity. And, you know, you talked about colonial Baltimore and photography and the, the, the you know, native people of Niger. And I mean, just the list goes on and on with all of her writings. She was just had a lifelong curiosity of, and, and much of it was research for her book, but she was, she was always reading, always curious, and um, there's evidence of that everywhere. Yes, yes. One of the things too I noted she um, she collected <laughs> um, university um, bulletins, and she would keep them in circle classes that were interesting to her, and then she'd make a list, cross reference those with topics she wanted to research at the library. So again. <laughs> ways to tie in her you know is she just never tired of that ritual i mean it 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 meant keeping her world it it keeping her brain open kept her world very large mm -hmm. and vivid what what do you think the the octavia who had won awards won the macarthur fellowship what what was she like um what no. Did she own did she own all of that success and did the self-doubt go away? Um, it's interesting you ask that because one of the things I did because there because there's so much struggle in that paper in the papers, because that's how people work out things, you know, you write them down, you know, and that's what journals are often for. So I was like when I had to cross-reference, okay, she won the MacArthur win. And then I'm going to the journals where like, okay, so did she go, yeah, you know, I won them, I, you know, I'm a genius. Mm -mm. There's nothing that I found, um, you know, and again, there's a lot of material, but I checked her commonplace books. I checked her journal. I checked the notes that she was making around the time. She saved everything from the MacArthur Foundation. So she had these big packets that came in and the articles that were written about her. And here was the thing that really got me. She also saved all the cards she got from people um, um, congratulating her. So I see cards from professors I know from UCLA. Wanda Coleman wrote her a card congratulating mm -hmm. her. The post office, the post office staff from the post office where she had her post office box they collectively wrote her a card congratulating her. Mm -hmm. So that's how you see the evidence of it in the archive of that moment. Um, as for her becoming more comfortable, the self-consciousness goes away, that, that really vulnerable self um, that you see early, um, it dims, but she's always struggling because I think she's always reaching. You know, and there are things about, again, being in crowds and public speaking. That's still like, that still dogs her. But she definitely, I think, began to see how important it was for her to be in the room, for other younger people to see someone that looked like her writing about the things that she was writing about, that I think it helped energize her and keep her in, you know, and just keep her going. And one of the things you, you also referenced um, in the book is how there was this inevitable question that came to her in one form or another at every panel, every speaking engagement about what it's like to be a black woman in, in, the, in the arena of science fiction. And it understandably bothered her after some time. And there was a wonderful quote, and I don't know whether it was something she jotted down or, or what have you, where she talked about uh, only only her blood could flow from her veins. Yes. And uh, it, that was really yes. beautiful. Yes, yes. Yeah. She goes, I don't know any other way it would be. You know, it's like, yeah. this is who I am. So it's yeah. it's been what it has been. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Um, and before we, we're going to go on to questions in just a little bit, but um, I do want to call out the incredible cover of this book. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how yes. that came to be? It's just, it's a gorgeous book with a, this beautiful cover. 
gorgeous. Um, we had been casting about about like, you know, what to do with a cover, you know, and um, Octavia did not like being photographed, and that 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 comes up in the archive too, and um, so there was a challenge, like how do we give the reader a sense of what this book is and who this person is and get her on the cover? Um, and uh, contacted an artist named John Stitch who does these gorgeous paintings of, um, of people um, that are like nothing <laughs> I've seen before in the sense that there's so many layers of expression, emotion, um, whimsy. And the, and this isn't, so this is not a photograph, but it's, it's, it's based on a composite of images seen. And then I also sent him images of what I had been living with in the archive. I wanted him to see the various notebooks and the pens and, you know, I got really nerded out about like, yeah, that little stick pen and that's the loose leaf. So what he did is as a backdrop, as her world, that's behind her. And this image of her, again, not a, not a photograph, but captures something in her eye that it even changes for me as I look at it. It's just remarkable. So um, yeah, I just, I'm so grateful because um, this this did it because we've got her her and her world on the cover. Um, what 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 more do you what more do you want to explore with Octavia Butler? What is left to, oh. <laughs> to learn? You talk. I know when we've chatted before, you talk about her voice. You still hear it. Yeah, I I still she's still whispering <laughs> in my ear. Um, gosh, there's so many pathways, you know go down with what is there. Um, I think there, like at first when this, when when COVID happened and the Huntington was closing and for safety reasons, and um, I knew that it was gonna be tough because I was like, wait, I've been in that archive almost every week you know, for like a, a couple of years, you know? Um, even if it's just to do something really small and double check on something. And so I miss her, you know? So in a way, I think maybe the distance will help me clarify what might be next um, for her because I had all kinds of different, I, like I said, this was not supposed to happen. I was really gonna be done with that first assignment, you know, four or five months tops. So how we are like five years later and still talking about Octavia Butler. So. Um, I don't know. There's some things that are are cooking right now. I can't name one, but yeah, there there's a lot there. There's 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 pieces that could be just about nature, for example, and Southern California, and what you know, and how it inspired her. You could do a book just on that, you know. One one other thing I was going to ask, and then we'll go to questions is. You you write about Octavia. There's just a great deal of confidence, and you know, um, you, just you really you really understand her, and that must come from the nature of this archive, which is so different than than others. You're sure. I mean, you you just have a real grasp of of really intimately who she who she is. Is that the archive or? Yeah. There's a real personal connection here, uh, clearly, from having read the book. That's absolutely the archive. And that really speaks to yeah. how she saved things, what she saved, why they were important. Um, because me going in, in fact, when I took the radio um, imagination assignment, my first thought was, I mean, I knew who Butler was. I had been in the room with Butler, you know, as a journalist. Um, I'd read her um, a little bit, but I didn't know her. You know, I was, I thought, how could I, how could I do this? You know, I feel like I need to spend more time, not three months. Suddenly, you know, <laughs> it's, you know, four years and yes, I got to know her. And it's because I started, I think 
for the interview, I decided I wanted to start with the the um, the more intimate paper, so the diaries and the letters, and so I could get a sense of who is this person, not the person, yeah, not Octavia Estelle. I wanted to know, and I didn't know that then. I just something told me try to get to the person that's not on stage, that's not sitting across the table from Charlie Rose, um, <laughs> or not the you know not this image we've erected for her, like you know, who was she and how did she get to be? And that's exactly it, it was the archive. All right, well now uh, I wanna give our audience the opportunity to ask, ask you some questions as well. So I'd like to invite Viha, um, our librarian in the Octavia Lab to come back uh, and help us uh, field some of these questions. V. That was fantastic. I mean, I'll have more to talk about in a bit, but yes. So <laughs> really great questions in there. I think one of the things we didn't really talk, get to talk about is how did Octavia Butler motivate herself and use her affirmations? Did she keep an altar? Um, I see no evidence of altar, but what I do see, she created big, She like she would take these old calendars that she got probably from the dentist office or <laughs> wherever, she would rip them apart and she would write affirmations on the back of these calendars and put them up <laughs> and put them up on, on um, post-its too. So, and she would also in the middle of a manuscript when she was having writer's block or was tired, she'd write an affirmation down in the middle of her work, big on the page. Um, but yeah, mostly what I, what I came across was evidence of, yeah, she had done these things really big. So they, I thought these had to hang someplace. These weren't just, you know, casually strewn around their, the desk. You know, these were, you know, obviously posted. So yeah, so there was that. Thank you. Um, here's another really good question. Okay. Um, what goals did Butler, Octavia Butler actually reach? Did she make her goal of 100K by 1975? I'm hinting at something. We got to celebrate. Yes, we are going to hint it. Yes, she did finally. Um, for some time, she would write out which bestseller lists she wanted to be on, and in New York Times, L.A. Times, Washington Post, and she would write it out frequently. She did not see it in her lifetime, but over the summer, she made it to the New York Times bestseller list it for parable of the sower and i so many of us i know just could barely contain our joy because she manifested it it took a while <laughs> you know it took a crisis you know but it happened <laughs> so yay octavia um okay do you have a favorite list or piece of ephemera of Octavia Butler that you found? Would you be willing to share something surprising or unexpected about Ms. Butler that you discovered in the archives? Um, I'll start with surprising because picking favorites, and I will try to, but um, surprising was I had no idea how, what a sense of humor she had because you see this very serious um, facade, it's visage that's just, you know, knitted brow and this deep voice. And she was hilarious. I mean, her letters are really funny. Her responses, like she had these date books where she, um, that had like a quote a day and she would argue with the quote <laughs> and often it would be funny, like like some kind of, you know, you know, uh, salty response to like some dead philosopher's quote or impression of something. Um, and also in interviews. I mean, sometimes you know, people would ask her things like, you know, what is what is science fiction? What is what, what is science fiction good for Black people? You know, why would it be good for Black people? She said, well, because Black people want to read about a world that has more than just white people and green people in it. <laughs> you know, so she just got to a point where it's like, oh, okay. Um, and as for favorite objects, mm, object. I'm trying to think of the things that I would return to. There's an image in the book of a little red notebook or orange notebook with, that's called Walk Thoughts. 
And there was something about those notebooks that I liked the most because I imagined, yeah, they were in her pocket, they were in her purse, they were on the bus, she took them to the library. So they're filled with so many little teeny tiny pieces of her day. And there, for some reason, those books, the small, small, small ones that she carried around and wrote down scenes of LA, to me, they're like little snapshots. Um, and I and I can hear her really loud and clear in those. So those are among, that. that's probably one of the things that I would revisit it more than once, more than twice, more than five times were those little notebooks. So Octavia Butler clearly had a writing, writing habit. What was Octavia Butler's writing process? Was it separate from her journal, from her to-do list, her commonplace book? That is, did she write daily? For what duration? You know, did she set mm -hmm. work aside between drafts? What was her process? Um, she, she absolutely wrote daily. Um, and she kind of wrote all over the place. And that was the thing that was interesting to me is that, yes, you know, there were dedicated, and I guess you could see, depending on what part of the process she was on something, she was at work on a novel and maybe on a second draft or closing in on the end of the first draft, she tended to be very focused on that. And so it would just be that. But most times she was writing, sometimes she would be working on the typewriter, um, but she'd take a break from that, work longhand, and then start in the middle and do one of her, her sessioning sessions, which was to kind of deal with her, whatever was on her mind that was frustrating her or to get through writer's block and then take up the novel writing again. You'll also find pieces of novels, dialogue on these magazine blowing cards, on post-its, on the back of a three by five card, on a recipe, on some newsprint, you know? So you have to know, it's like what I, again, back to she, whatever she grabbed became part of it. But yes, if she was early in the process or maybe at the very end editing, then you would see, you know, writing everywhere. And then as she kind of like, you know, honed in on what she was doing, then it became very focused. But yeah, every day she wrote every day. It's really clear. <laughs> she wrote something every day. Okay. What jobs did Octavia have, Butler have as she started to be a writer? Did she ever consider becoming a librarian? I have an answer for that too. Um, she did all kinds of work. She telemarket, telemarketing. She wanted to start her own um, business doing mail order. Um, she worked as um, she worked in a potato chip manufacturing um, house factory. She um, worked for May Company and also I think Broadway, no Broadway, um, as a telemarketer. Um, but she also worked in shipping and receiving, and because she liked the physical work, also she didn't have to talk to people. <laughs> she could kind of just move around and be in her head all day. The other thing, um, she actually considered, and when she was writing out these jobs she wanted and she was considering the library, she said, the only problem is I would have to deal with people and I don't know if I could do that. And so that was the only, she wanted to be around books, um, but she wasn't sure if she could interact with people. So <laughs> she had to strike that off the list. <laughs> I'm glad she's an author, okay? Let's just put it that way. <laughs> um, so what was her, what was Octavia Butler's reading habits? You do mention a little bit inside the book and you know, maybe you could just speak more to it. Um, sure, she was a very um, avid reader. She read for pleasure, absolutely. But she also read to learn and um, one of the things that I was fascinated by, and I'd like to go back and look at these more closely, she would read books that were on the bestseller list on purpose, and then she would write about them. Not reviews as much as like, why is this book on the bestseller list? Why? What does it do um, well? What does it not do so well? And it's still on the bestseller list. She was, and she would 
you know, these big authors of the day, you know, Stephen King, Mario Puzo, I mean, she would just like light into them, you know, like, this was not very good. And this is why this is not very good. But um, so there was that kind of reading too, you know, um, like, you know, reading for craft and reading for what was commercial and then reading for what filled her up, you know, um, poetry and, um, you know, or reading people who were friends and, you know, and in giving feedback. So yeah, she read in different kinds of ways. Okay, so in some of the letters to herself, she says that, she, you know, Butler wanted, you know, wanted to become, after she became a best-selling author, that she wanted to help create scholarships for black people or young kids. Mm -hmm. Was she able to accomplish some part of this? Did, did she manifest? Um, there is, there are scholarships in her name now. Um, Clarion, the the, um, the science fiction um, workshop she went to for the very first time, was the first time she'd been out of like LA to do something like this. Um, you know, there are scholarships through there. There's a Butler scholarship at the Huntington now. Um, so in her spirit, these scholarships live. One of the things I was really blown away by, and I thought this would be kind of wonderful, and I see a little seeds of it when reading Parable of the Talents, um, that she wanted to create a space for kids to go and read and have a library in the space um, and a place where they could do their work and have community meetings. And she starts to sort of sketch this out um, I'm trying to remember this is before the MacArthur. I'm sketchy on the timing, but it's something that she comes back to time and again, trying to design. And I thought, yeah, something like this needs to happen in her honor. I don't know how we raise funds for it, but yeah, it's very well. She structured it and she thought it out. And yeah, that was something she really wanted to do. Great. Thank you. That's inspiring. Um, so were you able or have you been able to interview people that knew Butler? What is it like? I am, you know. Yeah, um, I haven't interviewed because yet, <laughs> I say that yet, it was, and that was a strange thing because I'm so used to being in reporter mode where, you know, we set up the interview, but, you know, to do the first piece, the um, it really was supposed to be based only on the papers um, in my, my head that was like, I. And then when I was working on the book, the book came out of the papers. But in this time, being in the papers and spending time, I have met people who knew Octavia. You know, I've met good friends of hers since childhood. I met a, uh, a friend who lives in Pasadena. So it's been really interesting to see how she comes up in those conversations with people um, about, and what their reaction is, is to see their friend, you know, who, you know, stood on the, you know, bus stop with the pink notebook, um, quiet and withdrawn, up on a screen, you know, again, you know, at a conference, talking to Charlie Rose, you know, what is the distance between that person and this person? And that's been interesting, you know, just starting those conversations with people. And of course, your community of scholars. You know, yes, everyone, everyone who's been through the archives. Oh my gosh, yes. Yeah, the community, you know, that has grown out of that archive um, is has been remarkable. I've made so many new friends and our conversations often circle around her, you know, not so much what would she think or what would she do, but what she's done and what she's continuing to do. Um, and and the example she set and the this yeah raising that ceiling and moving the walls apart she absolutely did that and it's still happening. We did name a space after her. Oh my god! So I think we're we're at four thirty now. Thank you so much. Thank you, Linnell John, for such an interesting and enlightening program. Thank you all of you for attending. If you're interested in more quality programs, bookmark our YouTube channel or follow our Facebook page if you haven't done so already. We would like to thank Angel City Press for arranging the time for Linnell George to speak, as well as City Librarian John Zabel for taking time from his busy schedule to have this conversation. 
It's important for us during these times uh, such as these to celebrate accomplishments wherever they may be and bring joy wherever we can. If you're interested in purchasing an autographed copy of A Handful of Earth, A Handful of Sky, The World of Octavia Butler, visit the library store online. Um, proceeds from the store help support the library. Also, tune in later tonight for our 6 p.m. family-friendly LA-made program. Join expert paper crafter Sarah Neal and learn how to make your own greeting card by repurposing materials you have at home to create a unique card to this holiday season. And with that, um, have a wonderful evening, and we hope to see you soon. Thanks so much. Thank I think Octavia would like that program we're having later. And I again, so thank too. you, V. Thank you so much, Linnell George. Uh, this is a continuation of the relationship this library has with Octavia Butler, I think. Thank you for uh, this incredible book and for joining us today. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much for having me, really. This was wonderful. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, V. Bye-bye. Thank you.